All right, hello. Thank you for attending. Let's see, how about the next slide? This month we will touch on management practices for when it's dry and what should be done during this time. Let's jump right in and start with dry areas and grazing when it's dry. Avoid overgrazing as grass growth slows during this time of year. It has been said, the grass is starting to turn brown, it must really be summer. This might be true from looking on the outside, but as pasture management goes, grass being brown doesn't represent the full picture. Air temperature, soil moisture, soil makeup, location, nutrient value all play a part in what color your grass is. Another factor that must be reminded is just because it looks dead above ground definitely doesn't mean it is dead below. And the picture with A and B in it shows a difference in pasture lengths. The A picture has very short grass lengths for the animal to eat versus B picture, which it seems there is plenty of grass to graze. The picture up in the top left corner is an example of high traffic and feeding area bare spots. We will talk more about this issue on the next slide. The top right picture I thought it was a good picture for an example of a pasture rotation map to better illustrate pasture rotation planning. Would Joe, Bill, or Emmett like to comment before moving to the next slide? This is Bill. I said one thing, and I, I think I might bring it up later again. This, it's also a good time of year uh, when it's driest like this. Um, again, through that the picture up in the top right where it shows you different uh, pasture rotation paddocks or, or small areas you set up. It's a good idea this time of year to observe where your greener versus drier areas are because some of those areas um, where it's naturally maybe a little more moisture, groundwater or whatever, might, might be your, the one you actually want to save for this kind of year. Um, or those two little areas, or it might mean you, you reorganize your, your uh, temporary fence lines a little bit to better adjust, just because you know you're going to have a little bit better areas in the summer months that, that then conversely you would want to avoid probably earlier in the spring because they might be too wet. So just sort of a natural way to, now is a good time to step back and see what your natural landscape and your, and your farm, just is how it functions naturally and how you can uh, maybe adjust your fences uh, at some point uh, to match match how it actually physically operates or, or works in the various seasons. Excellent. Thank you, Bill. Okay, next slide, please. On this slide, I will talk about cool season and warm season grasses. And then Emmett will discuss the grass growing cycle and rainfall. Starting with cool season grasses. Cool season grasses grow best in cool temperatures. Optimal growth takes, takes place between 60 degrees to 75 degrees Fahrenheit. A typical growing season starts with a flush of growth in the spring, then slowed sometimes to dormancy in the summer, followed by another flush of growth in the fall. Cool season pastures are dormant through the winter. These grasses need to be watered during hot, dry periods or they will go dormant and turn brown. Pastures that go into dormancy due to heat and drought can be injured or even die. Many cool season species will retain a green color in climates with mild winters such as the oceanic climate of the Pacific Northwest. Warm season grasses. Warm season species are best suited to the tropical and subtropical climates of the southern and southwestern regions of the United States. A typical annual growth cycle begins with a slow green up in the spring as temperatures rise. Thrive during the warmer, warmer temperatures. Optimal growth is between 80 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And then go dormant and turn brown when the weather gets cold. Warm season pastures are more heat and drought tolerant than cool season grasses, making them a good option for warm, semi-arid and arid regions. Southern grasses are sometimes overseeded with cool season species in early fall to maintain a green color through the winter. In addition to providing a green cover, overseeding also protects dormant 
warm season grasses from extreme cold temperatures and traffic wear. Okay, uh, Emmett, do you want to discuss the growing cycle and rainfall? Sure. Um, in our area, unless you specifically add warm season grasses, your pasture is likely to include only cool season grasses. And that's just because they're better adapted for our climate. And as we begin to see more effects of climate change, having those warm season grasses in there to deal with droughty summers, like the one we're having this year, um, longer or hotter temperatures might be a really good idea. But it's something that you'll want to look at different options available to you and select one that's best suited for your soil conditions and your topographic and aspect of your site. Um, you know, we have this awesome growing condition in the spring for grasses and we're getting a huge uh, flush as the soil begins to warm of growth. Uh, and then also with fall rains, but we do have that slump in the middle and not only because of higher temperatures, uh, but also because of pretty low rainfall. And if we look at the rainfall chart there for Mount Vernon, uh, getting next to no precipitation between June and middle of September there. Um, another thing to point out there is that our highest month of precipitation is November. And that correlates really well with about the time we want to pull livestock off of grass to give it a chance to um, flush up a little bit for the fall and then have those nutrients and energy stores available to get it through the winter successfully. Um, so right now, now is a good time. You may have started to run out of feed. You don't really want to press your grasses too hard. This is a good time to think about pulling those animals off and Having them in a confinement area for a short amount of time here, pastures can rest. Um, really maintaining that grass between the three inches um, will also help with moisture retention and allow your pastures to survive a little better and produce a little better the season. Uh, having that three to five inch range there helps keep the water vapor down closer to the soil and uh, it just creates a better environment for grass to grow. Awesome, thank you. Does Bill or Joe want to comment? Nope, I don't have anything else to add. Okay, next slide. Feeding in dry areas. It is advised to not feed animals hay or grain on the ground when the soil is super dry. Animals can create bare spots where weeds can invade, meaning the over time, those bare spots will take up lots of weeds if nothing else, if there's no grass there. Horses can get sand colic from ingesting just dirt, a lot of dirt in their feed. And picture one shows the contrast between the left side of the fence bare and the dry, and the dry, dry versus the right side, good growth and looks to have plenty of moisture. In picture two, this is a common issue we are asked about at the conservation district, ground being bare, muddy near feeding and drinking areas. Moving feeders frequently to avoid compacting is one alternative. Depending on the location of the feeders and if moving them is not workable, making a heavy use area protection designated for that specific area might be an option too. Heavy use area can also be called sacrifice area. In picture three is a picture of sheep on pasture, but with an area that is becoming bare under the two sheep looking at the camera. An alternative management practice might be to use portable fencing and rotating pastures. Would Joe, Bill, or Emmett like to comment before moving to the next slide? Yeah, that picture too is sort of our classic late summer look for a lot of our pastures and areas where we have livestock. Um, you can see that the soil is getting bare. That's a good opportunity to put in footing material, whether that's hogs fuel, sand, or gravel to prevent mud and be able to better clean up the organics. 
um, you can see that it's starting to get pretty compacted and that grass is getting that golf course look. And remember the roots mirror uh, the height of the grass above the ground. So when we already have dry conditions, if you're allowing your grass to get that close, then it's gonna struggle twice as much because it just doesn't have the ability to access soil uh, moisture that's below the top two or three inches. Yeah, and just, just to add another reason not to feed animals uh, hair grain on the ground is just that you end up wasting some sometimes and it's hard, you know, and it's and feed is money. And so it's always better you can see what's going into the diet, what they're doing. And that's just always, that's another reason to just try to feed them through a feeder of some type that, that fits your animal rather than, than, than just lose, losing, throwing a little bit of money away. Okay, thank you. Um, next slide. Harrowing. Harrowing is beneficial for a couple of reasons. Even though harrowing is a good tool for early spring, using a harrow when it's dry has benefits. It scarifies and aerates the soil. It breaks up clods and levels heavy soil. It stimulates new growth by aerating and preparing the soil to receive water. The spreading and working of manure of, or other fertilizers. It also levels molehills and clods, helps spread manure and makes it easy to mow through the rest of the summer months. Chain harrows are an expensive farm implement that provide in environmentally friendly way of approving grazing or grassland. Probably the most beneficial use is after grazing, harrowing will, break, harrowing will break up manure piles and evenly distribute the nutrients in the manure. Breaking up manure piles prevents grass from being smothered by manure. This also helps with controlling parasites and pest in insects such as flies. Breaking up manure exposes fly and parasite larvae to sunlight, which dries them out and kills them. A harrow with teeth or tines may be adjusted to tear up the ground more aggressively, which may be use useful if you are planning to overseed any pastures uh, in the next month. And the pictures are just different, different styles of pasture harrows. Would Joe, Bill, or Emmett like to comment before moving to the next slide? Jeff, if you're um, if you're grazing or taking a cutting of hay, when is the best time to? Would you say like kind of right after you do those activities, or wait a little bit? I would say. I mean, I think if it grows a little bit, it helps it a little bit. But if you're for, for cutting hay, I mean, like a week after, but usually it's already started growing by the time you get the hay off anyway, from when you cut it, you know, there's been that many days that's went by. Um, and for when you have pasture, uh, as soon as you move them or they get out of it, I would, it'd probably be good because it breaks that up right away, breaks up the manure right away. This is Bill. I wanted to add a couple things too, and then also I think um, I think we're open just to remind our guests. If you want to ask questions in the middle, we're we're totally open to that. So you can either do it through chat or ju or just jump on and ask a question. But a couple comments I want to make is um, uh, I, I think especially when we're thinking about the rain that that thankfully is going to be coming in a couple days. If you did have the harrow and scarification just basically means you're scratching the surface and you're breaking up that that sealed top that 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 ends up developing in those heavy use areas by your animals where they just just basically uh, impenetrable surface that cre creates and so if you scarify that break that up a little bit it's going to allow that water to soak into the ground faster rather than just run off and so you can then capture that in your in your subsurface soils to to help make keep those roots healthy and help keep the grass there and to not cause erosion and 
and um, just not to lose the value of that water that's free coming out of the sky. And a second benefit, one of the things that again helps funds these pasture workshops is is some State Department of Health National Estuary Program funding because one of the problems in our shellfish beds around Skagit Bay is too much bacteria and ag is just one of the contributors. There's septic tanks, there's dogs, there's homeless people, there's a lot of things. But uh, by, by doing these things, we're helping to capture those nutrients and bacteria and let those soak into the ground rather than run off when we get these rain events. So, so there's not only much great benefit to you as a as an animal owner and you know saving money and growing good grass, but it's also just benefit to your neighbors and the other uh, shellfish, which which is a different kind of farming, but it's farming we have in the Skagit. So we always we always want to try to do best to help our fellow people producing you know the either for food or or recreation or enjoyment. But well, we're all in it together. So just wanted to share that's one of the things benefits and things you're doing for your community when you do these kind of things um, and like i say if we're open to anybody of the guests you can ask questions at any time otherwise for sure when we're, we're done with our slides there's a couple more there's plenty of time for questions okay next slide Planning to receive. Planning is the key word. This means if you're planning to receive or lime or fertilizer, this is the time to plan. It's a great time to order what you need for next month when it's the optimate, optimized time. Especially if you're reserving equipment, you want to schedule in advance to make sure it will be available. Remember, Total renovation should be done only as a last resort when pastures are unproductive or unhealthy for your animals. Ways to reseed or fertilize. In uh, reseeding PR1, uh, that's total renovation. Road tilling and plowing down old pastures and reseeding any new perennial grass based mixes. Weeds and soil erosion are a risk in the first year doing that. Uh, be patient and let pasture establish with no activity. Meaning don't have any, you know, don't put animals on it when it, it's just coming up. Another. Jeff, how long should you keep animals off after you reseed? Well, it should be at least until the first cutting, I think. I mean, well, even it's just so sensitive. I see a lot of people that even it looks deceiving because it looks like it's grown. I mean, you get, it comes up and then it's just, you know, it's not, uh, hasn't been established yet. That's why they call it an establishment year is for the first year. Hey, Jeff, can you just can you describe the pull test that that mimics what the animals do? Um, you, you know how to describe that pull test is one way to find out when when your grasses are at least close. It may not be as robust as you're saying is ideal, but one way to go ahead. Go ahead. You you you. Okay. So so what the pull test is basically when your animals um, are in there and they grab them with their lips and they pull on that grass. If it's too young and not established, as Jeff was highlighting, they'll just pull the roots right out. And so you as the, as the farmer, you can go out and you can watch that and you can take a few samples, just tug and pull on that grass. And when, when it breaks off at the grass blade and the, you know the roots are strong enough to maintain it in there. But if you pull it up and it comes out by the roots, your animals will just be pulling all that right out. And so you will lose your, your grass and, and all that investment. So it, it can be a matter of uh, days or weeks, but between that establishment, but that's that's a good, cheap and easy way to make sure that you know that um, that they're just not going to pull it out by the roots and, and you're going to lose all that ground cover. Perfect. Um, let's see, the broadcast, yeah. oh. okay, go ahead. Um, I We had an example of one of our livestock advisors who traded a small pasture to someone else for a couple of years. And the people went in and, and they immediately plowed and, and they ended up, 
they plowed it up and, and dissed it and properly um, planted a new pasture mix in there. But the number one thing that came out of it was all uh, the poison hemlock was just <laughs> where the seeds had just been sitting there dormant in the soil. And it, the whole thing came up in poison hemlock. And so they've had to really do a lot of spraying to kill that. And I know that the owner of the pasture wishes they had not chosen that system. Right. And that's an excellent um, example uh, uh, for just for an experience, because that's the tough thing is if you do go that route, you're just like that situation. You don't know what you're going to pull up. So that's the downside of that. And uh, thank you for sharing that. I would, I would say for that, I bet it's, I don't know, that's, that's hard to predict that that's going to happen, but that's why it's being suggested, you know, only at the last resort to do, you know, if you're not getting what you want or you don't, uh, for your pasture that you, to do that, a renovation. Let's see. So is there any more questions or? I got a little bit more here on the two other ways um, to recede. So the, in the middle picture, that's the broadcasting overseeding PR2 picture. This is probably the lowest cost method for seeding new, new pastures into established pastures. It's ideal where the soil is prevalent, meaning bare or showing. Apply by a seeding spinner or by hand, tarting bare patches where present. One option after seeding high density grazing events is allowing animals to tread in seed. It's a high level of management option though, meaning you gotta be, they go in and do that, uh, tread that in and then you take them right off. The second option is to roll or harrow following a broadcast. Personally, if you are broadcasting seed, rolling or harrowing after would be the most beneficial versus not doing that. The key to grass germination is soil to seed contact. Never forget that. That's an important, important factor. After soil to seed contact, moisture, moisture, moisture. If it is possible to irrigate or supply water to a reseeded area after seeding, then I highly recommend it. Uh, the the third picture is the no-till drill or the slot seeding PR3 picture. No-till drilling new perennial grasses, legumes, and herbs into tightly grazed established pastures is, is how they do this. Shown above is a um, no-till drill. There are many different brands and styles of no-till drills. After drilling, it is recommended to harrow or roll. Stepping in, stepping in with livestock, with livestock is also another way to press the seed to soil contact. Again, it's a very high level of management to do that. Adding and introducing new diversity and into tired old pastures will be very beneficial. Using this method gets the quickest results without destroying the sod. Specialist equipment may be hard to source, meaning no-till no drills are hard to find for rent. The district has been trying to acquire a no-till drill, but we do not have one at this time. We hopefully will have one by the end of 2021. Any comments or would Joe, Bill, or Emmett like to comment before moving to the next slide? Um, I have a quick comment, it's Janice. Yes. Um, we had to do, it wasn't intentional, but um, because of another project, um, well, through the conservation district, we ended up having to do a lot of um, basically renovating the pasture um, because it had been dug up anyway. But one thing that happened is that and I don't know the name of the weed, but it has a floret and then it's sort of a, it goes up pretty high. It's a white lacy um, flower. 
but that had been just sort of right next to the heavy use area, but now it's spread over the whole pasture where they um, had plowed, so, or, you know, rototilled. So that just happened unintentionally. Right. Yeah, that, that's, uh, that's, a, uh, that's happened before. It's not the only person that's happened to. Okay. <laughs> I think this is Bill. <clears throat> I just I just wanted to point out too about this slide is that that uh, and and thanks Janice for that. Um, if I might try to drive by and see what that plant is just so I know and see what your options are. Emma and I can take a look or something. But uh, this is to plan to reseed. So okay, it's already up there. So um, this is to plan to reseed. So it's not to, we're not saying to do that now, right? Because the key is Jeff said is to have that moisture when you want your seed to germinate. So you know, it's just a plan. What are, what are your pieces? Maybe have your soil test done. Those kind of things now, so you'd know what to do later in September or early October or whatever when we start getting our our anticipated moisture. So just this is about planning right now. Right. Yeah, and that that is exactly the um, the plant that shepherd's purse. That's what it is. Yeah, that's a bugger. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the planning, so really, I would follow up with the planning because when you plan, because the window is not going to be very open, it's not going to be a very um, big time when it's time to do it. And that's where like a couple of days could be too long um, versus if you're ready to go and, you know, as soon as it rains and you know there's going to be a little time in between it or you know the rain's coming then you can do it right before it versus planning, you know, you, okay, this will be a good week. And then you don't get to it till Friday and it's already just started raining a whole bunch and you can't get out there. So that's kind of what that, the planning, how important it is to be planning so that when that window opens up to do it in a day or the next day, then you're ready to go. I think one of the important thing to remember is, you know, when you're slot seeding, you are getting that good seed to soil contact uh, talked about. And so for a lot of our grasses, you'd probably be planting, Jeff, correct me if I'm wrong, but, you know, in the like 25 to 30 pounds per acre range. Um, but if you're broadcast overseeding, and that would even be pretty tough to do in that uh, picture there in the middle because of how much grass cover is there, but you want to certainly uh, increase the volume that you're putting down when you're broadcast seeding because you know that not all of it is going to get good soil conditions to germinate. You might want to do something like, you know, 40 or 50 pounds per acre. Right. Well, I would caution the putting out numbers just for the purpose of the seed. Different seed will have... Um, you know, different varieties will have a different recommendation for how much to put on. Um, so that's all. I would just bring that, you know, that, that everything else was good. Okay, next slide. If we have any more comments or questions. Okay. On this slide, Emmett will discuss taking advantage of construction season and construction season and what this means. Go ahead, Emmett. Yeah, this is an excellent time um, to start some of those capital projects or facilities or infrastructure projects um, already. And that means having pre-planned that. So uh, figuring out if you're gonna need a permit, you know, getting that in advance. Uh, for a lot of small projects, you don't need a permit, which is great. But, you know, making sure that your contractor is available or, uh, you know, like this year, we've had a lot of issues with our supply chain and with material prices. So, you know, if this is something that you thought about, maybe you were lucky enough to purchase lumber or pipe or concrete, um, you know, or get your contractor locked in in advance. Um, you know, our, our soils are dry and stable, and we can get out to a lot of different parts in the field that it might be more difficult 
do uh, throughout the rest of the year. And you can really control the working conditions here. So um, these are all projects that Skagit Conservation District has helped fund with different landowners. Uh, we have a couple of different manure bins here and each one of those cells in the manure bin is about eight by eight. And when it's stacked four feet high, that's gonna hold about 10 yards, which uh, is approximately the amount of manure that a single horse is gonna produce. So um, if you're doing your confinement and your composting correctly and stuff, you can figure one eight by eight bin per horse is about what you'll need. We also have a couple different photos here of heavy use areas or confinement areas. These are packed gravel over a non-woven geotextile fabric. And what that does is it prevents mud. It provides um, sturdy footing for the livestock. It allows that water to either drain through or run off so you don't have bonding happening there. And it's a really easy surface for you to collect manure, waste feed, and organics from. Perfect. Do we have any questions, comments? Oh, uh, one, one other thing I think is also, uh, and you might have touched on it a little bit, that's just the importance of if there's any drainage management that needs to get done in your ditches, um, it's a good time to, <clears throat> where you might have a clog or where uh, some soil has slumped or, um, you know, branches are down in there that reduce your efficiency in your in your drainage ditch. Um, it's now is the time to to deal with that because once once the rain starts and everything's wet, um, there, go. So, the there we go. We're already switching to it. So um, okay, I, I jumped ahead. Yeah, but you're good. Keep going. Yeah, I guess that's because I yeah I wanted to highlight because lots of times what will happen is all of a sudden we'll get calls and and the water's already started and and it's just really a lot more difficult to deal with that later on and in, in in a ditch or a salmon stream right and so so we we just encourage everybody to go out and, and walk the lines look at where you think the problems might be get in there because there's no water there you can do a lot of the work right now and get that cleaned out um, especially if it's a ditch you can just do it as maintenance now any anything if it's an actual salmon stream you, you need to go through um, and and work with get a hydraulics permit which again the conservation district can help with that um, that's one of the things we do um, help people walk through that because um, many times you know in, in doing that you're solving other problems for the for the environment as well as what might be causing you problems in re restoring and maintaining that drainage so um, just a, a real heads up now's the time to do those that kind of work because by the time you get into the late late especially into november december you're you probably can't get in there and do that work because it's just too wet and uh and first the coho start coming up in uh, around thanksgiving is when the fish start entering all these streams the adults so then, then you really shut down on what you can or can't do so that's just something to, another reminder to give you right now that, that that's a good part of especially in Skagit County in western Washington got to maintain that drainage or else if it's too wet you know your flooded pastures the grass dies and and it's a mighty mess for your animals so it's 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 just part of the part of the regular practices that somebody has to do excellent thank you Bill well uh, next slide. Uh, let's see how, thank you for that. That wraps up our PowerPoint. And Emmett, do you want to? Does anybody on the presentation today have any further questions? Yeah, or questions about other things that they might have on their mind right now we're i'm pretty sure we're all open to having a little casual conversation that's what this usually turns into so if you have any other general questions or or you know wanting to contact us hi karen hi so i was typing up my my question i have some people coming over say in the next 15 20 minutes but um my question i have two parts question i guess the question is this uh, acre that I hydro seeded in March and it's been okay I'm keeping it hydrated 
I have, um, the, it was previously um, field. And so there's a batch of thistles in there. And um, so I'm wanting to get down and, and get rid of as many thistles as possible. But um, back on, that's just, that's one section. The other section is, um, and harrowed and tilled, and currently uh, my tractor guy has been haying, so he's not available. But we've been tilling under the uh, steeples pyrea that's going to come back. We, um, I had it removed last year so that I could actually use this section. I'd like to replant that with some um, mixed seed for uh, wildlife. And just, um, and no, so those are, I'm not really sure. I mean, I'm learning as I'm going, I guess. <laughs> yeah, but Jeff, you, you guys want to go first? Sure. Well, I think um, as far as the thistle is concerned, it, it's good to get an identification on that because different thistle species have different life cycles. If you have that Canada thistle, um, you really want to be careful with that because it spreads when the rhizomes are broken up. And so the more you're disturbing it or the soil, uh, that's how you can kind of keep regenerating it. Okay. Um, you can use a broadleaf herbicide, which would have the grass intact, but would kill that. Uh, you could just aggressively continue to mow that and prevent it from flowering. If you have something like bull thistle, that's a biennial. And you can just pop those suckers right out of the ground because they they just have a tap root and you have two years to get them before they go to flower. So a little easier to manage. Yeah, I've been mostly, you know, doing the mowing to keep the keep them from flowering. So find out what what they are. Um, have we been have we been out on site yet, Karen, for a site visit or anything? No, I would love to have you guys. Is that, is that you, Bill? Blake? Yeah, class of 77. Go, Karen. Hi. No, I'd love to have you guys come out because, um, yeah, I've done a, a lot in the last couple of years, and now I'm ready. Uh, those of you who don't know, Bill and I had this conversation probably about five or six years ago at a class reunion, and it's taken me a few years to get to where I'm at. But I'd love to have you guys come out. Um, I go back to school on the 1st of September. So I'm pretty open for the month of August. And like I said, I want to see that section that, that is now just ready. Okay, the first question is, and you're in Skagit County though, right? I am. I'm okay. up in the Alger area. Perfect. No, I was just making sure that's... Yeah, <laughs> yeah they hear a lot of Snohomish County stories, Karen. So, um, so okay, <laughs> well, if we don't have your contact information, email... email um, Annie at bill at scadgetcd.org and I'll work with Emmett or Jeff and we'll set it set them up, okay? Okay, yeah. No, I, I've been on in Skagit since eighty nine, so yeah. <laughs> I'm definitely I don't know, crossbreed. <laughs> Skagit snowmish, I guess it's yeah. all. <laughs> all right, well thanks. Um I'll I'll send you guys an email with my information and then let you guys um, get back to me on a date you can come out and <laughs> Sounds great. Good to see you, Bill. <laughs> you too. Thanks for saying so. I was going to say something. That's good. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going to sign off and um, I'll connect with you guys in an email. Okay. Take okay. care, Karen. Thanks. All right. Any any others uh, questions? Um, Janice or Jody, you want to questions or Joan, you want to bring up or talk about? I'm wondering if you can throw out a date for when people can start seeding if they want to reseed their pastures this fall. Jeff, you you probably have the best idea up in different well, areas of this gadget what you might think would be a good time. Well, I would say like like this year is is one of the you know this there hasn't been a summer like this ever so. I would say once there's consistent moisture, um, even though it's just it's going to rain on Friday, I don't think I don't know if we're going to get enough. I would say September is a good month, you know. Uh, you know that's I wouldn't I don't have there's no specific date. It's hard to just give out dates when we have these different kind of years. 
but as soon as there's moisture going to be consistent moisture then that would be a good time and jeff you and i were just talking yesterday i think about some of the different germination time frames for different species and i believe orchard grass is, is a couple weeks whereas some uh you know annual rye grass or other species might come up in just a few days so i want to think about that in terms of timing with moisture as well right right Yeah, I would be in such a warm and hot, dry year, I think, you know, patience, patience would probably pay off, but not wait. So not go so clear till the till close to, you know, Halloween that you might get a surprise freeze or something like that. But uh, um, yeah, I, I would be patient. I was wondering, do you have a date on your manure spreader when when that's going to be available? I, I did just, just so you know, I did send in last week, I sent in the, a request for approval to uh, um, the State Department of Health for us to be able to spend the money. We picked out the model, or the trailer, all that kind of stuff. So I'm, I'm waiting to hear back that they approve our purchase. And so with that grant funding. And so once we get a, a approval from that, um, you know, then we'll we'll make sure and hit the order button and get it here as soon as possible. So we're just, now we're just pending, waiting to make sure because it's it's I what I can't think off the top of my head. It's it's around eighteen thousand dollars total or whatever. So it's it's I want to make sure we have approval to spend the money before we do it. Okay. So, but it's 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 almost there. Thanks for your patience. Sorry about that. Okay. okay. Any other questions, comments? Okay. Well, good job, Jeff, on your presentation. Thanks, Joe, for running the slides and Emmett for your good comments and Joan for your support and guests for being here. We'll talk to people next month, all right? <laughs>